technology of the Val, and look where it got them. Dead and buried. This is the largest soul core I've ever seen. With this, we could power the canal systems. But it isn't charged. There is still latent energy in this machinarium from its ancient operation. These lines in the stonework should lead to generators. You might need to find some more soul cores to spin them up, but everything looks to be in surprisingly decent condition. Maybe the golems have been maintaining it. In any case, it should still function. We'll have to remove that large core from the wall, of course, but that shouldn't be a problem. We have some skills here that you'll probably recognize if you've played PoE 1 before, but they feel a bit different to play now. Spark is great in these tight passages, since it bounces around. We've added a Pierce support gem to really allow it to hit an entire room of targets. For a more single target focus skill, Arc is a good choice. It does more damage to the first target you hit. Now, if you find yourself surrounded, it might be good to use Ice Nova. It hits all enemies around you and slows them down with chill. Just be careful, getting up close and personal isn't the ideal place for a sorceress to be. He doesn't have the defenses of a more melee oriented character. If you want to help with the sorceress's weak melee defense though, you could use Arctic Armor. In Peewee 2, Arctic Armor is a buff that builds up as you stand still. You can see the ice crystals forming around the character. They'll drop off if you walk. When monsters hit you, they take cold damage and build up to a freeze, so it's a great defense. Just be careful, you have to be standing still for a little while to get the full effect, so trying to start a step isn't the best strategy. Now, Arctic Armor is an ongoing buff, but did you notice it didn't reserve any mana? How does that work? Well, we were pretty sick of the fact that in we won basically every character was playing with no mana pool, so we decided to change the way that reservation works. There's a new resource in Peewee 2 called Spirit. Spirit is a dedicated resource you can use for ongoing effects like Arctic Armor, Heralds, Auras, or even Minions. Everyone starts with 100 Spirit, which is enough for most ongoing effects. But if you want more than one effect, you're going to need some more Spirit. Spirit is available on mods from items and on the passive tree, but if you're willing to give up your offhand slot, the easiest way to get it is by holding a Scepter. Now, if you want to increase the cold damage you're dealing, you can use a Frost Bomb. It places a bomb on the ground that reduces the enemy's cold resistance while it's ticking down. It's a great opportunity to use some cold skills before it explodes. And speaking of cold skills, a great skill to use on monsters with the slower cold resistance is Comet. This is a new skill in PoE 2, and it hits pretty damn hard. It costs a lot of mana and has a really long cast time, but it's worth the wait. It does a devastating amount of damage. To help get you out of danger, your character moves back slightly as it casts. It's pretty hard to hit a fast moving opponent, but it's great on tougher enemies that stand still, or even a larger pack if you're further away and can predict where they're going to move. Now, if you run into mana casting too many of those, I guess in an emergency you could cast your free to cast fireball. Where did that come from you ask? Well this is a great opportunity to explain the way we've changed caster weapons in PoE 2. Now in PoE 1, caster weapons had a default melee attack that nobody used, and because they had that, they also had a bunch of attack mods that would spawn in them that were useless to a caster. In PoE 2 we wanted to clean that up, so now each staff comes with a built in free to cast spell. Just put it on and spam to your heart's content. Now this particular staff is the base type that you get right on the starting beach, and it's quite likely that you're going to outgrow it, so that's why we have a lot of staves with more utility focused powers for casters to use. Here we have a crystal staff, it's got a pretty cool built in spell called Unleash. Using it slams your staff on the ground, and will allow you to triple cast whatever you cast with your next spell. Now of course you're probably going to want to use that with something powerful, and Comet is a great option. You'll notice that Unleash is one of the few skills in PoE 2 with a cooldown. In general, we really try to avoid using cooldowns because we really hate the feeling that combat is just waiting to be able to use your next skill. But it does make sense for Unleash since it's free to cast and it's something we want you to be using situationally anyway. Now, if you're facing something tough, you might want to try out Mana Tempest. Mana Tempest creates a circle of power in which your character literally hovers over the ground. While in the circle, your mana drains, but it powers up all of your spells. Lightning projectiles fork, beams chain further, and you'll also do a lot more damage.
Act 3 is set in the ruins of the vile civilization which fell thousands of years ago. Jungle has taken over their former once great cities and we'll be exploring it using one of our six new character classes called the Monk. In Peewee 1 we had one character class for each of the combinations of strength, dexterity and intelligence. When looking at the design of Peewee 2 though, we realised that many of the new skills that we were trying to design just didn't really fit thematically with the existing classes that we have. Being a spellcaster with a bear form makes sense for Strength Int, but it doesn't really sound like something that a Templar would do. We realised that since we had new mechanics for every attribute combination, it actually made sense to design new character classes to explore the new themes. In Peewee 2, every attribute combination has two classes associated with it. Strength Int has the Templar or the Druid, on Dexterity you have the Ranger or the more spear-focused Huntress, and on Dex Int you have the Shadow and the Monk, which Mark is playing here. Each class has its own three ascendancies that let you further specialise the class in the way that only that class has access to, but they both start at the same location in the passive tree. The quest rewards you're offered on the two variants are tailored to the class, but of course this is Peewee, you can still mix and match anything to your heart's content. Looks like we've come across the boss for this area. In Peewee 2, every area of the campaign contains a boss of at least this difficulty. That's over a hundred bosses to fight as you make your way through the campaign and they all have unique mechanics to learn. As you've seen from watching Mark fighting, the melee combat in Peewee 2 has a very different feel than before. We've done a lot of things to add mobility to combat. Practically every melee skill in Peewee 2 has some kind of movement built into it. The Monk in particular is a melee fighter who specialises in mobility over brute strength. So, as Mark has been playing, you might have noticed these blue markers over enemies. Mark has a skill equipped called Killing Palm. Whenever an enemy has a blue indicator over it, it means that the monster is low enough life to cull with Killing Palm. Successfully executing the cull will give you a power charge. This is an important skill for the monk, since many of his skills interact with power charges. One of the great things about the skill is that it has a built-in dash forward, which makes it much easier to target the skill at the right point when you need it. We've done a lot of work in Peewee 2 to make using skills like this feel satisfying. If you're accidentally targeting slightly off the monster, the skill will automatically lock on to the cullable target, and we'll even do a small amount of pathfinding around obstacles. We really want to make sure that when you've got an opportunity to use the skill, nothing is going to get in your way. Once you have some power charges, you need some skills to power up. A great follow-up is Falling Thunder. Falling Thunder without a power charge just creates a relatively small lightning AoE in front of you. But do it with some power charges and it turns into a pack clearer with a large number of extra projectiles. One thing you'll notice here is that like almost every melee skill in Peewee 2, Falling Thunder has a bit of extra movement built in just in case you need it. Using the skill within range and you'll do a flip in place. But use it at a larger range and your character will move forward while executing it, getting you into position without any time penalty. In Peewee 2 you also get a short period to redirect your target. Notice how you can start the skill facing one way, then whip the mouse sideways to land the skill in a different direction? In order to get power charges, you're going to first need to get some lower life monsters into a cullable range. You've got a few options. If you want to charge right in, Whirling Assault is a good option. It doesn't do much damage per hit, but it covers a lot of ground. And notice how you can turn as you do it? Generally speaking, you never lose control of your character in Peewee 2. If you make a turn at the right time, you can get a couple of extra hits in on the monsters, getting them into range of your cull. Follow up with a Killing Palm, then finish off the rest of the pack with your Falling Thunder.
these skills, here's a great combo to try. First, cast Frost Bomb to reduce the target's cold resistance. Then use Mana Tempest to increase your damage. Follow up with Unleash, and then triple cast the Comet to do a truly insane amount of damage. This rare monster dropped an uncut gem. This is a good opportunity to talk about how skill gems drop in PoE 2. Instead of dropping specific gems, you can find uncut gems. Just right click on them and pick whatever skill you want. The gem will come pre-leveled to the level of the area that dropped it, so it's a lot easier to change between skills in PoE 2. This time, I think it might be cool to grab one of our meta gems. Meta gems are skills that can have other skills socketed into them, changing how they work. In this case, we're going to select Cast on Shock. Let's equip this thing in the skill screen and choose a spell to trigger with it. I think Comet might be fun. Because Cast on Shock reserves Spirit, we'll need to first disable our Arctic Armor. We have to decide if we'd rather have the extra defense or the extra offense of the Cast on Shock using our Spirit. In PoE 2, trigger gems use a system of filling up cast time on each trigger. Basically, if a skill has a short cast time, then we'll trigger it really often. If it's got a long cast time, like this Comet here, it will take a lot longer to trigger. You can see up the top left, there's a counter that says how far it is until your next trigger. And there you are. Using Cast on Shock, we'll automatically cast Comet whenever we're using our lightning skills. So we've found the generator. Time to power it up. power is restored to the Mechanarium, all the Constructs are coming back to life. We'll need to fight them on the way back to the charged Soul Core. One thing that PoE 1 players might have noticed is that this character has both Ice and Lightning spells. That's pretty inefficient, isn't it? It's a big no-no for most builds, because any specialization into Cold or Lightning isn't going to affect the other element. And generic elemental damage increases are not going to be as powerful as focusing on a single element. Well, in PoE 2, we have another major new system to introduce to solve these kinds of problems, and it starts with Weapon Swap. Now, in PoE 1, Weapon Swap isn't really used much for its originally intended use case. We imagined that people were going to be swapping in and out between different weapons to deal with whatever situation they were in. People just don't do that at all, and a large reason for that is because it's really awkward to do. In PoE 2, we wanted to solve that. The staff Octavian is using here has an Ice Mod on it that makes it great for when he's using his Ice Spells. We would also like to be able to make sure that the build works just as well for his lightning spells. If Octavian equips his previous staff in his second weapon set, you can see that it appears on the character's back. Now we're going to open up the skills screen. If Octavian opens up the skill options for his lightning skills, you can see here that you can choose which weapon sets are usable with each skill. First, we uncheck set 1 from being used by his lightning skills. Then, we go through the cold skills and turn those off with his lightning weapon. Now, when we use Spark, the character will automatically switch to the Lightning Staff on his back, and then use the skill. When Octavian uses Ice Nova, his character automatically switches over to his Ice Staff before using it. Trigger each skill for which set to use, or both if you don't mind which. There's a very short time penalty to switching, so it can be good to leave some skills on both sets if it doesn't matter which weapon set you're using. But we still have the problem of passives. Wouldn't it be nice if we could specialize in both Cold and Lightning passives on the character? Well, in Peewee 2, you can. We're on the passive skill screen here, and you can see that we're close to both a cold and a lightning cluster. At the top right of the screen, you can see where we have some weapon set specific points to allocate. If Octavian holds shift, he can allocate set 1 to the cold passives, and then allocate set 2 to the lightning passives. Now check this out. As we weapon swap, our passive tree changes from one build to the other automatically. Whenever we cast the appropriate spell, the character's passives reconfigure on the fly to the correct build for that spell. Now you can't do this with every passive on your tree. Only points granted from skill books will allow this kind of dual specialization. So you can't change from a mace slamming warrior into a fire elementalist with the press of a button, but it certainly increases the number of options you have for builds. There's a huge number of places where the system can shine. You could augment your dagger shadow build with traps, or have a great curse setup on your witch in one spec, and then move to your chaos debuff spells with the other. It really opens up your options. We need more time. A 
Another fun metagen to try out is called Barrier Invocation. This works a little bit like the trigger gem I talked about before, but this one charges up as your energy shield is hit by monsters. I think we might like to put an Ice Nova in this one. The more energy shield you lose, the more charge builds up until the point where you're able to cast the skill you socketed instantly. Lose some energy shield, and then at just the right time invoke Ice Nova to cast all the stacked up versions in one cast. If you keep losing shield, you'll build up even more charge for even more casts, so it's a great defensive option in an emergency. Here we are, back at the charged soul core. All we have to do now is take it. How hard could that be? Oh, oh dear. Uh, now we just have to remove it from that construct. I'll uh, give that to you. We've now entered the Val Mechanarium. This is the place where the Val built the various constructs they relied on to power their civilization. Now this is a find! A Val ruin that hasn't been looted? I wonder why nobody's been in here before. One useful feature that we've added is the ability to call in NPCs to where you are, to give you more information, help you with quest objectives, and so that you don't have to always go back to town. In this case, we'll call in Alva to find out what to do. This mechanism... If powered with a small soul core, it could open that door. There should definitely be soul cores somewhere around here. They had to power these constructs somehow. As Alpha said, we need to find a soul core to open this door. Let's explore. Stay back. If you want to shave off some life without getting too close to some of the more dangerous monsters, a good option is Wind Blast. Wind Blast also doesn't do too much damage, but it keeps the enemies back. The closer they are, the farther they're pushed back. So it's a great option for keeping smaller, but high damage enemies at bay. Note that the bigger the enemy is, the less they'll be pushed back, so trying to push back some giants isn't going to be effective. And there's the soul core. Let's get back to the door. Your fate 
is sealed. Consider me impressed. I'll keep investigating in here. Bring me in if you find anything else. If you need to defeat tougher enemies, it might be time to break out some of the ice skills in the monk's arsenal. Glacial Cascade creates a wave of ice that moves slowly in front of the player. It's pretty ineffective against fast moving monsters because most of the damage occurs right at the end of the wave, and so a lot of monsters will just walk right by it. But if you can find a way to make a monster stop at just the right place, it can be very effective. In order to do that, you probably want to freeze monsters. The monk has a few different tools to do this. A fairly simple option is to get right in the monster's face with Ice Strike. Ice Strike doesn't do too much damage on the first two hits, but attack three times in sequence and you can get off a combo that has a much higher chance to freeze. Get in there with that freeze, then roll back and finish the job with a Glacial Cascade. Now, remember how Glacial Cascade had that extra damaging spike at the end? If you've hit a frozen enemy with that spike, it shatters the ice on the enemy and does a devastating amount of damage. Oh yeah, I just uh, casually mentioned rolling back before. Did I forget to mention that in Peewee 2 we added a dodge roll to every character? Just press spacebar at any time to roll. There's no cooldown, no limitations. It even has a bit of built-in pathfinding so you don't get stuck on things. When you dodge roll, you're not invulnerable. If something hits you, you're going to feel it, but most things will not hit you. That's because while rolling, projectiles and melee strikes will always miss. You'll have to roll out of the way of a slam that has AoE, but anyone swinging a sword or throwing a fireball is going to miss. Now another really important function of the dodge roll is that it lets you cancel out of almost any skill at any time. This makes it so you don't feel like you're getting stuck doing a long animation when something is about to hit you. It really changes how skills with longer attack and cast times play, and it makes dodge roll feel like a very reliable way to avoid attacks. So, that's one way to get out of the way of damage, but the monk specializes in mobility, so it makes sense that he would have a few more. Wave of Frost is one of our new attacks with a retreat built right in. You move backwards and throw out a cold attack with a significant freeze. The great thing about this is it puts you at a good distance to follow up with Glacial Cascade and do a whole pile of damage. Hey look, another soul core. Another skill you can use to get some extra freeze is Shattering Palm. Shattering Palm is another palm strike that puts a small ice bomb on your target. Kill or deal enough damage to the target and the bomb will explode, doing some damage and a significant freeze. It's a great option against bosses, where the wave of ice might not be enough to get that freeze off, but you really want to get that Glacial Cascade damage bonus. Get back. The final skill we're going to show you today is Flicker Strike. It's a monk skill now, and another skill that consumes power charges. If you've played POE 1, you know what to expect. It's a great finisher for tough boss fights, and uh, it looks pretty impressive too. Face your demise. Hmm, another door. I wonder what could be in there. In order to take down this boss, we're going to need all the tools in the monk's arsenal, especially the combo of Freeze and Glacial Cascade. If you're a POE 1 player, you might think that you can't really rely on Freeze because there's so many bosses that are immune to it, but in POE 2, that's changing significantly. In POE 1, Freeze is a binary mechanic. An attack freezes the target, or it doesn't. What this basically means is that in POE 1, we were forced to add Freeze immunity to many bosses, because Freeze just trivialized them. Because of that, freezing was something you only really used while pack clearing, and not something you could rely on as a core part of your build for boss fight. Here we too though, all crowd control mechanics now have internal meters that allow you to build up to a freeze or stun, or whatever other CC mechanic you might be using. It's a little bit like poise from games like Elden Ring, though the meters tend to be a lot smaller than those games. When you freeze an enemy, it increases the amount of freeze you need to do another freeze, but the increased difficulty bleeds away slowly. More freeze will always let you freeze the boss more often, 
but this system means it will not get out of control in party play or interact badly with other CC mechanics, allowing us to let these kinds of mechanics actually work against all bosses. Blackjaw has dropped a consumable quest item, the Flame Core. It's a permanent plus 10 to spirit. In POE 2, we really want to make sure that you feel rewarded for exploration. It wouldn't be much good if we made all these awesome optional bosses if we didn't have something great to find for killing them. One of the things you might find for killing a boss is a permanent stat bonus to your character. Your head Yeah! 